Okay, everyone. Um, I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to talk about video conferencing in slide 64 of the 307 slides I have available for you today. <laughs> I'm kidding, there's not that many slides. It's 304. Um, I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about a different thing entirely. I've been involved in industry, in the IT business in fact, for 27 years now. And I have seen a series of different things. And I've worked in the reseller community, and I've worked for different written manufacturers, and I've worked for Life Size now for 10 years and helped design the product. So we will talk about video conferencing near the end of this presentation, but I want to talk about something different first. So let's talk about this old phrase. Of course, we all know it. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always had. Everyone knows that's true, don't they? It is utterly false. It is utterly false. If you always do what you've always done, your business will go bankrupt and your business will fold if you don't change. So, let's talk about change and let's talk about something different. Let's talk about a thing called an accession event. An accession event was, was postulated as a concept by a British science fiction author who died of cancer actually earlier this year. And he talked about an accession event in a society form as, for example, you're a, uh, a Hawaiian warlord, you own your local island, you probably suppress the people in the island next door, and you think that the dugout canoes you've got and the gods you pray to and the society you've built is all there is. After all, you've never met anyone else. And suddenly a steel ship with no mast turns up in your bay, and you've got this new king that you've got to pray to, or... Give, uh, give taxation to, and you've got these new gods you've got to talk to, and everything in your life has suddenly changed. You could not see that coming. No guy in the 15th century in Hawaii went, you know, I wonder what the British are doing. Because there were no British in their universe. We're just like a spaceship arriving today. So, the world goes through things in a less dramatic way. I'm not going to talk about alien invasions today, but I am going to talk about the way that business has a similar, if not quite so dramatic, effect on society. And those things happen in two ways. They happen as evolutionary changes, or they happen as fault changes. And I'll explain what I mean by those. But let me give you a couple of historical examples first. So, does anyone know who these two gentlemen are? Their names are John Gorry and Frederick Tudor. Any hands? Anyone from Boston? Anyone from Florida? Anyone from America? <laughs> uh, there's no hands up. Right, okay. You're, maybe you are the space invaders. Okay, well, what do I do next? Right. Let me explain who these guys are. Frederick Tudor was, by Harvard Business School, and perhaps one could argue this tells you as much about Harvard Business School as you need to know, as known as in the 1930s and the 1920s and 30s as the Yankee Entrepreneur. What Frederick Tudor did was discover that people wanted ice. And what he did was break it up out of lakes just outside Boston. And he would put it on boats and he would ship it around the world. And you've never heard of this. By the way, 1900, that business was the ninth biggest industry in America. And you still haven't heard of it. Interesting. The, he made an enormous amount of money. That ice, by the way, he started by sending it down to New Orleans and Savannah, Georgia. And the people had never seen ice there before and they put it in salt to try and preserve it. <laughs> Stupid, aren't they? Except that the way they saw the universe was defined by what they already knew. There was a guy called Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was a, an Austrian philosopher. And somebody said to Wittgenstein once, why are those people in the Middle Ages so stupid that they thought that the sun went around the earth? I mean, surely every morning the dawn would show them otherwise. And he said, yeah, but if it had been the other way around, what would it look like? Of course, the point is it would look exactly the same. So what your knowledge tells you, tells you what you are seeing. <coughs> so Frederick Tudor, he died an incredibly wealthy man. That ice, by the way, went as far as London. In fact, there was a store in the Strand in London with a block of ice that used to keep in the window and hang a newspaper behind it. And it was multiple feet, th feet thick and you could read the newspaper through the ice. 
It was a wonder of the age. Queen Victoria used to drink gin and tonics, which were also a wonder of the age, by the way. The quinine in tonic helped you not get malaria. Not that you get malaria in London, but you would in India. And she would put ice from Boston in her gin and tonics. That ice went as far as Calcutta in India. He, by the end of it, he was losing less than 6% of his ice. Now, he died in 1897 convinced that mankind would never work out how to make ice. After all, what's colder than ice? So, made a lot of money, that man. John Gorry, John Gorry was a doctor trying to work out how his patients were dying of malaria and thought that putting them in cold rooms would be a good idea. So he did. It, it obviously helped because there's no mosquitoes in cold rooms and therefore they were more likely to survive. The problem was getting hold of the ice was horribly expensive. So he came up with an idea, uh, and in fact he came up with air conditioning, and he came up with refrigeration. In 1850, 50 years before the height of the ice business. So there is a man who is taking ice and shipping it in a boat all around the world, which all of us would look at and go insane, where 50 years earlier a man had invented refrigeration, and what happened to him? He died in poverty in 1855. Interesting. Here's another example. My own family, in fact. A little before my time, this picture was taken about 1900. My family were wheelwrights in North London. They made wooden wheels that went on carts. And they would rent people the carts. And the wheels, by the way, were about 80% of the value of a cart. There's a, a lot of skill in building wooden wheels. The problem was that by 1930, the business was bankrupt. The family you're living in abject poverty. We're talking 16 people to two rooms in a slum in King's Cross, an area of London I wouldn't go to now, let alone at that time. Now, why did they lose? They made great wheels. Well, they lost because, of course, wooden wheels weren't the answer anymore. So what they needed to, should have done is make a decision as to what business are they actually in. Were they in the wooden wheel business? Or were they in the finance business? Or were they in the high quality wood business? What they probably shouldn't have thought of was, we're in the wheel business. Because the set of criteria by which the technology was judged changed. And that is the fundamental difference between a, a fast moving market and an accession event. When I started in business 27 years ago, and by the way, I, got, I, I started in business at 27 years ago because I failed school and they threw me out and I could lift a fax machine. <laughs> and a fax machine at the time weighed 100 pounds and cost $10,000. And I'd been uh, loading scaffold on trucks for six months because that's what you do after you leave school and have not, nothing to do. And your father points out your rent-free existence in his house is now ended, <laughs> and you will be getting a job, and that was the job I got. So I got this job lifting fax machines. So we got involved. I got involved in the office equipment market very quickly. And uh, does anyone recognise any of these brands, Wang? Yeah. So what happened to Wang? Well, what happened to Wang was that the series of questions that customers asked themselves about what was a successful product changed. Same is true about Word Perfect. I was selling Word Perfect. I've been through a number of accession events, and it's funny to me that only now am I realizing, oh, oh yeah, actually, all these things happened. And in other markets which I've been involved in, you think, oh, that's an accession event. This thing, you think, oh, that's an accession event. I mean, I, this is the, I love this projector, whoever makes this. It's great, because I spend my life being blinded by the ones that sit on the desk in front of me. So whoever built that, well done. But that isn't an accession event. Because all that is, is, a, is an evolution of an existing technology. People haven't changed the set of criteria by which they buy a, a, um, a projector. They've just simply got much cheaper and, frankly, in this case, much better. But this isn't true for WordPerfect. What happened to WordPerfect? I didn't work for WordPerfect directly. I worked for Harvard Graphics. Who's heard of Harvard Graphics? Right. That was a terrible career decision of mine. <laughs> I joined Harvard Graphics. They had 86% of the presentation graphics market. You know it all was the PowerPoint market, but PowerPoint didn't exist then. And then Microsoft came up with PowerPoint and said, if you buy Word and Excel, then 
we give you PowerPoint. So I'm selling a $650 product that's significantly inferior to my competitors, that's being marketed by Microsoft, that they're giving away for free. I did not hit target. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks the office is done? All right, I'll put my hand up. I think it is, because it's all going on browsers. And uh, by the way, I can't run Office on my iPad or on my iPhone. And there's quite a lot of those out there. Out of interest, who's got an iPad here? Exactly. So it's not Office, is it? It's a different thing. It's a renting it by the week. Office 365 is a good example of the way they're going. But is Microsoft going to be able to make that transition from selling six, four, five hundred dollar licenses to selling on a monthly basis? I don't know. Their share price recently would suggest a lot of other people don't know either. So what's the difference between a quick market and an accession event? Simply the set of criteria by which you measure the, uh, the technology change. So, just said that. So let's talk about two examples, two great examples. Let's talk about color printers, and let's talk about mobile phones. So color printers, perfect example. Uh, about a uh, long time ago, about 20 years ago, I was living in Australia for a while, and I sold, got a job selling Tektronix color printers. Who's a, anyone ever sold a phaser? Yeah, they're great products. You get the ink cartridges and you shove the crayons in and they melt and you make a million dollars out of selling people bits of crayon. Great market, good products. When I was selling them, about $10,000 for a nice phaser 340 or a 300, the big one that you could print on sandpaper, which we'd always demonstrate printing on sandpaper and then no one would ever print on sandpaper. Why would you? I don't know, but we did it. <laughs> And what was interesting about that product was that that market has not gone through an accession event. Sure, the printers are now nothing. I mean, you, how much, you can go to, you can go to um, Fry's, you can buy a printer, and it's $80, and they give you $80 mail-in rebate. And you're like, what? But of course, they'll take a kidney in, in ink, jump, ink cartridges for the next 10 years that you own this thing. And someone actually calculated that inkjet cartridge ink is more valuable by weight than platinum which is an interesting statistic. I don't know if it's true or not, but it was, uh, it was one of those urban myths and who's going to measure it? I'm not going to take a part on the cart, which I can't afford to. <laughs> so anyway, that's a market at which the price just plummeted, but the set of criteria by pe which people measured it did not change. Another example would be projectors. Projectors haven't, I mean, they have. Is anyone from Epson here, by the way, just out of interest before I insult anyone? <laughs> right, it's a fine product, it you know, looks great, does what I want it to do, plugged it in, it worked, what else do I want? And it's probably a tenth the price of the last projector I bought. And it's great, but again, the success criteria by which the client measured it hasn't changed. So let me give you an example of a different accession event market. So who here in 2000 and odd, 2002, 3, 4, 5, owned a Motorola Razor? Right. So if I, that's about a third of the audience. So if I said to you, and you probably all own some kind of cell phone that was getting ever smaller. So if I turned around to you and I got in my Doctor Who TARDIS and I came back to 2002 and I said, ha ha, what's your cell phone like? And you showed me your Motorola Razor. And I turn around to you and say, guess what the phone from 10 years from now will look like? And you would probably say, well, it'll be the size of a credit card, the battery will last a month, uh, it will be indestructible. I mean, I've, the number of times I've thrown an old Nokia cell phone down the <coughs> railway station platform and running for a train when drunk was quite a lot. And you'd pick the bits up, you'd get on the train, and, and it would be fine, it'd be a bit scratched up, and who cared? And you would say, phones are getting smaller. You know, think about them 10 years earlier, they're big brick things, and the battery lasted 10 minutes, and then the battery lasted a week. I mean, I've been using my cell phone this morning my iPhone, for about an hour and a half. I think that's the first hour and a half long call I've made in probably a year and a half. I am in the video business. We do rather more video than we do audio. But the battery's half flat. So if I turn around to you and said, so my success criteria are size of a credit card, um, 
Battery lasts a month, indestructible. And I would say, no, 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 no. The phone's four times the size of your old one. The battery barely lasts a day. And if you drop it, it's $500 to replace the screen. <laughs> and you would look at me and go, well, how, how is that more successful? How, how have you, why is that better? That isn't better. And I would say, but it is. And I'd pull out an iPhone and I'd show you, I don't know, let's say Facebook and Candy Crush. Yeah? And, and that would be it. You'd be hooked. And you'd never go back to your... Motorola Razr again, and by the way, to give you a sense, Motorola Razr, they sell 452 million of those things. Anyone here still got one that they use? Anyone still got one in a drawer? Why? What are you going to do? You're going to use it again? Oh, I know, I'm sick of that iPhone, let's pull out the Motorola Razr. Does not sound like a conversation anyone's likely to have anytime soon. I mean, you, you, you and people go, oh, only the rich, only the rich. The cleaner in our office, and I, I'm sure she gets paid reasonably well, you know, probably $10 an hour. Our, our cleaner in our office has an iPhone 5. She's not running a Nokia. She's not running a Motorola Razr. And what you see in those organizations where the paradigm changes, their business is what's technically known as screwed. Look at Nokia's share price. Look at BlackBerry's share price. They missed the boat. So how does this all affect you lot? Right? You're not Nokia. I don't think you're not. No one from Nokia. After I said you're all screwed, no one from Nokia. Here, are they? Okay. I hope not. I guess they were. They'd be the one running at me with a knife. So, what do you do about it? So, accession events happen. They happen all the time. But there's things you can do about them. And what's interesting about accession events is that it isn't about a new technology comes in and simply replaces what goes before. The technology probably is already out there. It's probably already doing something else. It's probably keeping patients in Florida cool. It is not making ice in Calcutta, which is exactly what that technology could do, by the way, if they'd used it there. And they would have saved an awful lot of money and time with Mr. Uh, Tudor. So the first thing to do is no with the dogma. I've always done what I always done. Sorry, I'll always do what I've always done because I'll always get what I've always had. No, you won't. Not if you're a Wang dealer. Not if you sell people Microsoft Office potentially, but certainly not if you're selling people Word Perfect. Not if you're selling Motorola razors. The world changes if you think that you are going to continue to do what you've always done, unless you're about to retire. If you are selling your business in the next six weeks or retiring in the next 18 months, you can ignore everything I'm saying. But if you want to be in business longer than that, you better look out for these, uh, these accession events. So let's talk about elephants and crows. Now I know uh, CC will ask a, a tame. I know a lot about crows. Did you know there's quite a lot of conjecture as to which is the more intelligent? Crows or elephants? And in fact, most of the experts are now saying crows are brighter than elephants. Which is interesting. They have about 50 words in their vocabulary. They've been making tools for about 4 million years, so significantly longer than humans. Uh, they do remarkable things, like uh, if they've got uh, something they can't crack, like a walnut, they will fly above pedestrian crossings, drop the nut in the road, let a car run over the nut, wait, land, wait for the pedestrian crossing to start, and then go out on the road and pick it up so they don't get hit by the traffic. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Go to YouTube, look it up. It's amazing. I don't see elephants dropping things onto roads and waiting for the pedestrian crossing. <laughs> and what's interesting is crows have done incredibly well with humans. In fact, wherever humans go, crows follow them and do brilliantly. A, a beautiful story about crows. <clears throat> There were some people up in the Oregon area, some scientists who, or some university people, who couldn't work out why all these crows would, would arrive at this particular parking lot every morning. And they would spend, they spent months looking, what are they doing? They're just talking to, I mean literally just talking to each other. There's no food there. What are they doing? And an old boy was walking across the parking lot and he said to them one day, what are you guys all doing? And he said, well, you know why the crows, we're trying to work out why the crows are here. And he said, well, I know. I said, why? Well, you should be a landfill tip. Look, they're all talking to each other. And crows will actually talk to each other about where dangers are. 
So for example, there's examples where crows have been shot, like a flock of crows have been going over a farmer's uh, residence, a farm, and a farmer shot one of them for whatever reason, because he's an idiot, frankly, probably, and he shoots the crow, the other crows then dissipate, no crows will fly over that house for 20 years. And what's interesting about that is that it's not just the crows who were there, they'll tell the others. So, be intelligent is what I'm trying to say. You don't need to be a big organisation to be fast moving. But big organisations can also be fast moving. Here's an example. Let's talk about Mr Branson. Branson's quite a bright lad. He had Virgin Megastores. He'd been building it up for 30 years. He'd been in the record business all that time. When Virgin Megastores were, were very big, they sold, they diversified. They sold music, they sold CDs, they sold uh, printed music, they sold movies. You know, they had a big diversified business that did all sorts of things. Within three weeks of iTunes coming out with the ability to buy music online at 99 cents, Virgin had sold the megastores to a consortium of, of, uh, of VCs, who then watched their investment do that, just like it did for Tower Records and HMV in the UK and a bunch of other organisations. So what he did was, after an accession event, he realised he couldn't compete. He was no way that Virgin could compete with Apple when the rules by which the market worked had changed, so he sold the business very quickly. All the others didn't see it coming, and therefore are either ridden the wave all the way onto the beach, or they lost an awful lot of money, or both. He's the only one I know of who made a ton of money. So what can you do as a business? Well, what the first thing you can do is diversify. Diversify your business to the extent that an accession event in one part of your business does not become a killer of your business plan in every other. There is a phrase that says, accession events are the extinction events of business plans. <clears throat> and Nokia and Motorola and Virgin Media and a whole bunch of others would indicate that I'm right. So the first thing you've got to do is diversify your business so that you're not reliant on one thing. And that's one client, or three clients, as well as three things you sell them. If you sell them a type of laptop with another type of, uh, of server, well, what happens when everyone goes cloud and they don't need servers anymore? And what happens when they do BYOD and every employee buys their own thing and they all go and buy it from Fry's? Where are you then? Just an example, but it's impossible. So the next thing to be aware of is if you are diversifying your business, make certain it's not caught by the same accession event. As an example, in the music industry, someone could have turned around and said, OK, so music's going away, we'll diversify into movies. We'll do movies as well as, well, that doesn't work. The same accession event of delivering it digitally destroys all of it. Another example might be in printers, for example. There could have been, well, printers wasn't a, perhaps a great example because it was never an accession event. But if someone came up with a way of using a printer that didn't use ink and it was free to run, imagine what that would do to all the manufacturers. I mean, HP would be dead in a week because so much of their corporate profits come from toner and ink. I don't, uh, Tektronix is now part of Xerox, so I don't actually know what happened to them. So, so I've just told you the world is falling. Sorry. <laughs> world is falling anyway. Might as well get used to it. <coughs> but out of opportunity, uh, out of threat is opportunity. If you are the guys who go, I can't compete with that business model. I'll sell to somebody else before they've noticed. It's not a bad business plan. Mr. Branson made an awful lot of money selling Virgin Media. Or you can turn around and you can pivot your business. But I would strongly recommend that you get out there and make certain. No, you can't ever make certain. That's not fair. You attempt to look a little bit further down the line as to what's happening. So let's talk about three accession events that are happening right now. Three accession events we're right in the middle of. We'll do video conferencing last. The first one is BYOD, bring your own devices. I'm guessing that must be a threat to many of the businesses in this room. So must clouds, which would be the second one in here. That's meant 
It's very difficult to get a, a, a Google image of a cloud, so I decided to do that thing with all the zeros on it. it looks like something out of the Matrix. And if you think about what's happening, the cloud is becoming this concept which is sort of laughable considering what the man from IBM said in the 50s. He said, we in the future can see that the world will need at least six computers. In reality, we're getting to the point where there is one computer. It's called the internet. And everything we do is a connection to the internet. How useful is your tablet or your iPhone or your Windows 8 thing or your laptop or your MacBook Pro or anything unless it's connected to the internet? I mean, it's just a crap typewriter at that point. Right? You can't even print anything out. I can type it and then you can look at it. That doesn't really work. Oh, I'll put it on a floppy. Oh, no, it won't. I'll burn it on a deep... No, it won't. So don't have any of that stuff anymore. So without the internet... None of it works, and the reality is, is that all the devices we've got today are just windows to that single computer. So how does that affect your business? Because if you're selling people desktop computers and laptop computers and printers and servers, and the customer says, no, 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 we just get all our employees to go and buy their own thing from Fry's or Best Buy or wherever, and, uh, and all our services are hosted on the cloud, what does that do to your business? I don't know. Think about it. And then the third one, and I will throw this in, painfully I have a vested interest, but I truly believe this, videocracy is changing the way that people live their lives too. Because the, the way the world has worked is since 1945, productivity in America has gone up on average by 1.8%. And that has gone up because of technology. We are more efficient because of technology. I mean, 25 years ago, remember, I was picking out those fax machines and putting them down on people's desks and making them look simple. And the old, wizened, 26-year-old sales guy was actually doing the pitch. And in those days, no one looked at a fax machine and said, well, we'll buy one of those because it'll save us on uh, postage. No, because those thermal transfer rolls cost a fortune. And people would turn up, 10 people at a time in an office would turn up to a fax machine demo and I had people turn up with a manila folder and say, can you fax that? And you're like, well, take all the documents out. Like, no, I'll just fax all of it. Like, it's not a teleportation machine. It's, <laughs> but they didn't know that, right? It's, it's, like, it's like the Wittgenstein. They're, they're, what they already knew defined what they saw. And as a result, fax machines changed the way that people worked. Because people, for the first time, could get that quote out to the customer that afternoon. And therefore, they beat their competitors who said, yeah, I'll write you a, I'll write you a, uh, I'll write you a quote, and the secretary would bang it out on her Daisy Wheel typewriter, or if she spent 10, or you'd spend $10,000 on her behalf, she had a, um, and it was always a she, had a word processor, and then they would print it, and then you stick it in the post, and have you got the quote yet? Oh, yeah, I did, and I ordered it from the other guy, because he got me the fax three days ago with the quote, and I faxed him back the order. It changed the way that people did business. Now, here's another interesting fact. Technology in other things other than our world is not getting any better. Your car at 60 miles an hour is just as fast as a car from 40 years ago doing 60 miles an hour. I have noticed that. You could have a Bugatti Veyron, if it's doing 60 miles an hour, it's no faster than my old Subaru. And that is the fact for everybody. No one's driving around the world at 250 miles an hour unless they're on top gear and, and they're not actually going to a meeting. Aeroplanes, did you know a, a, a Boeing 707 is 20 miles an hour faster cruise speed than an Airbus A380? So you're not getting to any of your meetings faster. In fact, the only fast aeroplane we ever really built, Concorde, failed. And it failed ultimately because it wasn't fast enough. Because the market that needed it needed to be instantly at the other end. So businesses that aren't investing in this technology are going to lose against ones who do. Now, I'm not going to show, ask for a show of hands, because I did this at the last Cinex event, and a few people put their hand up, and then a lot of people said to me afterwards, I wanted to put my hand up, but I didn't want other people seeing this. So I'll, I'll keep this, uh, don't put your hand up for this one. Many Cinex resellers have a problem. They have one or two or three or five customers who do 80% of their business for them. It's the Pareto 80-20 rule. And the problem with that is, is that they spend their entire lives servicing those few customers which means they never have any opportunity to go off and find new ones. Video could help there. Instead of having to spend that Wednesday afternoon driving off to that customer site 
to have that meeting, you could simply see them every day on video, speed up your business, just give them the video conferencing system, they're not very expensive anymore. Have a much tighter, stickier relationship with that client, and more importantly, have time to go and see other clients. See, the biggest problem you all have, we all have today, is there are only 24 hours in a day. Bill Gates said it recently. It doesn't matter how much money you got, you can have $10 billion, and I think he knows the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, it's $10 billion, I still get 24 hours in a day. And businesses are looking for things to speed up that activity. <clears throat> now you link that with putting the infrastructure into the network, and the idea of BYOD, so people can put video, for example, onto personal devices like tablets and iPhones and other devices, that fundamentally changes the way that people do business. That is, in fact, an accession event. That is not a, we've just got a little bit better of a phone call. So where are we fitting into that? Right, we've done a couple of things. LifeSize has, uh, has virtualized all of our infrastructure. So no big hardware boxes anymore. So your client can start very small. They can put it on their VM. Out of interest, how many people here sell Hyper-V or VM environments today? Okay, right. Hope more hands next year and good for you, those of you who are. This is now an application. Video conferencing is no longer a bizarre, otherworldly thing. Uh, I've turned up with this half million dollar bridge. Would you like to try it? Uh, well, what is it? Well, it's a bridge full of, I don't know, warm tapioca. It's not. They're all full of smoke. Everyone knows that. All electronics full of smoke, you know? When the smoke escapes, it doesn't work anymore. That's right. So, these days, Video conferencing is now an app, you download, you shove it in your VM environment. If you're already the trusted advisor, you've now got the opportunity to interact with that client in a fantastically new way. You get a stickier relationship with them. You have more time to go and see other clients. Oh, hey, and you also make some money doing it. So there's no bad thing here. The second one is, one of the things we noticed was that clients very rarely rang us and said, thank you. I've noticed that the remote control you've built has got more buttons than the previous version. That will make it easier to use. <laughs> no one in history has ever said that. So why does Sony put ever... I mean, you need a pin to press the buttons on a Sony remote control these days. <coughs> for, for dialing wand mash keypad. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So we got radical, and we changed the, the user experience. So anyone who's got an Apple TV will be entirely familiar with the way that the user experience works now. It's what we call a heads up. So old video conferencing systems, and that means all of our competitors and us until about four months ago, was look at the keypad, press a button, look at the screen, check it worked. Look at the keypad, press a button, look up. Now the other problem is you're doing this in front of 20 of your closest work friends. People are more afraid of public humiliation than they are of death. So as Jerry Seinfeld said, most people would rather be in the box than give the eulogy at most funerals. <laughs> Difficult to know if that's... The, I don't know how you poll that, with perhaps with a Ouija board, but anyway. So people... Do, it goes around like a hot potato. Everyone goes, I don't know how to use it. Someone has to use it. Someone junior gets it. It's a catastrophe. No one wants to play. Let's get back on the boat, or the plane, or the car, or however else they communicate. So we make it radically simpler. We've got one here. The beautiful CC will be demonstrating later. I will be in rehab by then. <laughs> and then the third one is a thing called WebRTC, which I'm happy to talk about, but out of interest, who here knows what WebRTC is? Great, one hand. All right, you're all about to get an educator. Two hands, thank you, CC. I rather hoped you would. Um, let me tell you about WebRTC. WebRTC, uh, web, uh, the RTC bit, web stands for web. RTC stands for Rich Something Content. Forget what the T stands for. Never mind. CC, can you tell me? No? Okay, so, that's right. I'll edit that bit out of the film. So, uh, WebRTC is um, an interesting technology which effectively means that video conferencing application is now built into Microsoft, uh, sorry, uh, Google Chrome and into Firefox. Firefox one's a little bit sketchy right now, the Chrome one is better. Now you can go to our website and you can follow a link and you can experiment with this yourself. So why does this matter? It matters because for the first time people will, are going to be able to do high quality, not quite high definition, but not a million miles off it, video conferencing from a web browser without any plugins, without any download. 
And people have said to us, well, surely that's the accession event for video conferencing. You're all dead. No, we're not for numerous reasons. The main ones being, it's only an endpoint. There's no, there's no one you've got, there's no, uh, there's no address book. There's no one to dial. You need to meet somewhere. I, I would recommend you meet in here, in this little world. So you can do multi-point calls, you can do streaming and recording, you can interact with room-based video conferencing devices as well. But what it does is increase the opportunity for people to get involved in video. So, again, I'm just making this interactive as possible. Who here knows what Metcalfe's Law is? It's an education today, folks. Right. <laughs> Dr. Metcalfe, quite an interesting, quite a bright chap. He did things, for example, like invent Ethernet. Now, I think that puts him in quite a high-end pantheon of, of folks you should listen to. He said, the utility of a network goes up at the square of the number of nodes in it. What that means is, the more people are in a network, the more powerful the network becomes. So when Facebook had 50,000 MIT graduates in it, who here cared? Nobody. Now it's got everyone you've ever met and all those people you want to check up on from school to see if you've done better than them, everybody wants it. In fact, you're a bit of a pariah if you don't have Facebook these days. Or LinkedIn, or, well, Twitter, I still can't work out Twitter, but the others, they have value. I mean, the internet itself, as it got bigger, it became more useful. As it became more useful, it got bigger. Video conferencing is going the same way. So for the first time, we're going to increase by probably two or three or five or seven orders of magnitude more people that you will be able to communicate with. One of the big problems for video conferencing from forever, and I've been in this business for 18, 20 years, is that people would say, well, I could spend $100,000 on one of these, but what if no one else has got one? Yeah, that was a problem. Now, anyone with a web browser, and frankly, Chrome's the only game in town, it's 43%, by the way, the global market for, for uh, web browsers today. Not bad in five years from a standing start. Not an accession event, by the way but certainly a fast-moving market. And so that is going to change the way the world works. So a couple of things, and then I'll talk about where I think some accession events are happening for society on an ongoing basis. We've actually got some of our gear here. I'm not going to talk about the ins and outs of our product because we've got a website for that, we've got salespeople for that, and we can, we can and CC and I can show you demos later. So come and have a look. What I wanted today to be about was thinking differently. Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always go bust at some point. So last ones. And then I'll take any Q&A if anyone has any. Um, what are the big ones from a global societal perspective coming up? Well, I don't know, right? By their nature, accession events are not easy to, uh, not easy to guess. But there's a few. 3D printing. The personalization of printing is probably going to be a very big one. Now, out of interest, I discovered the other day from the magazine that if you, if you want the best way of guessing where the world's going, subscribe to The Economist. Just subscribe to The Economist and read it for a couple of hours every week. And it won't tell you, and in the future it will be, but over a period of time it will give you a framework at which bits of information finally fit, rather than them all being a jumble. And, and it's been a revelation for me. I've been reading it for about 15 years, and it's fantastic. So, about 10 billion different things are made on the planet every year. So, in other words, that doesn't mean spoons, the spoons that are here, or the coffee cups. That's one item. So, all those coffee cups are all the same as one item. So, 10 billion different things are made which is remarkable. I, I can't even, I, who counted them for a start? I don't know, but there's a lot of stuff. Personalization of printing will revolutionize that. I mean, let's be honest, certainly this is true in the UK, it's probably true in America. You can pretty much tell anyone in their 20s what year they moved into their apartment or home from which IKEA furniture they own. <laughs> because it all looks the same. Oh, you were in IKEA in 2003. Yeah, yeah, we've got that. We've got the Ektorp, which is their the most popular couch in the world. They're all the same. 3D printing will revolutionize that. It's particularly great in things like this, which is personalized things like limbs for prosthetics, because every human being, of course, is a slightly different shape. 
And so the one size fits all wooden leg doesn't really work anymore. That's why folks with some of these super duper legs like that, the uh, murdering man in South Africa, <laughs> uh, allegedly. Um, <laughs> of course, you just shoot people through the door of your bathroom. Well, I thought it might be. Uh, yeah, right. Anyway, moving on. Um, that fella is faster than most humans. He's certainly faster than <coughs> me. So, 3D printing, probably an accession event for manufacturing. The next one is the death escape velocity. Does anyone know who Dr. Aubrey de Grey is? He's a mad English scientist who may have come up with an incredibly interesting idea. He calls it the death escape velocity. The death escape velocity is the concept that if I could give you, in the next couple of years, 20 more years of, and I don't mean of decrepit, I mean of, of relatively active life, during that 20 years, I may well, because of the speed at which medical advances are, are increasing, I may well be to give you 50 years. During those 50 years, I might better give you 150 years. During those 150 years, I can probably make aging go away. That's called the death escape velocity. He doesn't believe, and I think he's at the forefront of this, uh, this science, he doesn't believe that anyone who's an adult now will probably make it. We will probably get old and decrepit and die before they work out how to rescue us, as it were. But small children, people being born now, they may make it. So what difference would that have on society? Well, I don't know. But I do wonder, how much effect would it have on all of us if you knew you were going to live 500 years? Would you take a bit of a longer term view? Would you plant more trees? Would you dig out less of the coal and say, sod it to the next generation, they'll work it out? Hang on, no, that's you in 50 years from now. Maybe you'll have to work it out. Maybe you'll take a longer term view of society. I don't know the answer to that. It's an interesting thing to consider, though. And what happens when some of the world gets this and other parts of the world don't? Do we become different species? Don't know. I sell video conferencing equipment. What do I know? But it's an interesting thing to consider. And the last one is this idea that we have as Americans, or pseudo-Americans, as I am. I'm from East Texas. Very East. <laughs> so, the idea that we have that we're all going to eat beef, we're all going to eat meat for the rest of our lives, and, oh, I, you know, and I do find it funny in America that the quality of a steak is measured in its weight in ounces. That does make me laugh. Um, oh, that's, that's a 22-ounce steak. That must be better than the 8. No, it isn't true. But this idea that we're all going to eat protein in a beef form is insane. It cannot be sustained. For every pound of beef you put on your plate, 2,000, two tons, 2,000 litres of water. Two tons of water is used to grow that, grow that animal. 60% of which is thrown away, by the way. So if everyone in the world decides they want to eat beef, and everyone in the world decides that they want organic, then we have no rainforests. And every single square inch that isn't city becomes farm. And do people want that? I suspect not. So one of the ways we're going to do this is we're going to eat insects. Because insects are far, far more efficient at the way that they grow protein. It's also much better for you. Out of interest, I'm sure a lot of you go, I don't want to eat insects, that looks repulsive. Who eats prawns? Lobster. What's the difference? Now, I'm not suggesting that they're going to take, I mean, frankly, picking the Picking the legs off a wasp is probably a bit awkward. Right? <laughs> but combining these technologies may be a reasonable way of doing it. If you remember the other day, or if you noticed the other day, there were some folks in London who ate the burger that they'd, um, they'd just created out of pure protein. Well, they're already creating skin and blood vessels uh, for, in 3D printers. So potentially mixing 3D printers with protein either grown or from insects could have a radical change in the way that we live our lives. And by the way, it could also help with global climate change, because 18% of all the gas, greenhouse gases that, that are now polluting the world come from cows. In fact, they're a bigger problem than cars are. So it's going to be an interesting world. And I hope, if number two is true, 
we'll all be here in another 150 years to discuss whether this presentation was accurate. <laughs> so at that point, I have no idea what my timing is, but I will take my over. And yeah. we're fine. Perfect. So I'm, I'm between you and lunch, but I will take any questions at this point that anyone has. And as I say, I would encourage you to come and have a look at uh, about technology because because things will change in your business. So at least get educated whether you choose to use it or not. So, anyone got any questions, or should we go and eat something? So, I've heard rumours that you are pulling, not going to be participating in the Luke Womb system. Do you want a comment? No, I won't. Is that a statement or a question? Well, it was a question. I've heard rumours. Well, yeah. We, we're going to pull out of that. We have. I don't know that we've officially stated that, so, so maybe we should turn the camera off, but too late. Um, no, we're not going to get involved in that product. We, we looked at it. That, just for those of you who don't know, Microsoft has this product called Link, which I assume most of you are aware of. Uh, one of the things that Microsoft has done is said, we want room-based video conferencing with a Link device. The reality is we looked at it, we built it under a previous administration, and uh, we made the decision after our original CEO came, returned to the organization less than a month ago, we looked at it and went, it's a contract manufacturing role, there's no profit in it, it's a distraction for our sales organization. We had the world head of sales for Microsoft Link come to our booth at WPC in Houston, the big Microsoft Worldwide Partner Conference, and look at Link, look at our LRS 1000 product and go, well, they're terrible. We don't want that. I want that. And he pointed at a life-size icon, which is the product you'll see in there. So we decided we're not a contract manufacturer. It was a poor business decision, and we simply don't think the customers are going to want that. What, the, about, what about your system of interoperability with something like uh, uh, Link or the Tango? Because right now there's so many standards in video conferencing that it's like, yeah, it's great. I have a video conferencing system, but uh, Polycom won't talk to Tango, won't talk to LifeSize. And, you know, what Microsoft is trying to do there is, well, they want to be the big five. They want to, you know. Yeah, they want to impose their standard. They want to rule that. But they are talking about interoperating with, with other vendors. Yes, and we do do that. The, if you go back a couple of slides, our UVC platform allows Microsoft Link systems to communicate with LifeSize or Tamburg or Cisco as they now are or Polycom. And I will say that the industry, the video conferencing industry, has got a lot better in the last five years or so about interoperability. Do you get every possible super duper feature that each manufacturer does as a result? No. Do you get a pretty high common standard today? Yes. So I think that it's a bit unfair to say the video conferencing industry doesn't interoperate. They do. I also will say, just for the record, Microsoft is very good at saying, yeah, well, here's our standard. Uh, hang on, that's not standard. Then if you're the only one doing it, that's proprietary. Well, we're about to see it itself. Is it can be implemented in so many different ways that who's yeah. the most compliant at it? And, and if you look at the different products that you're looking at something like you think is proprietary, and you, you open the hood and find out that that's more compliant to WebRTC than some of the Google stuff is. Yeah, it is. But uh, let's be honest. The way the whole IT industry works, what is the standard? It's the most widely adopted. Right? That always is the one. You can write anything you like in an ITU standard. What really matters is what the market goes and does. And Microsoft is playing with a, a version of WebRTC and trying to get that approved. But I think the weight of the rest of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the market will push Microsoft back. It'll be interesting to see what happens with Bolt. Well, one of the things you touched on was the address book. Because what's a phone without the phone directory? You know, yeah. well, who am I going to call? Well, I don't know who to call them, how to call them. Ah, but let me give you, so let me, that's a great point. So let me talk about a very simple, and I'll give you an example of a use case, right? If you are a relatively regular video conferencing user, you're going to want something like our ClearSea product. That, that gives you a, an application that runs on your phone or your iPad or your laptop or your Mac, and that works great. And the quality's superb and, you know, all those things. And you have an address book and people can find you and you have presence and all those things. But if you're a consumer at home, and you've never been on a video conference call before, and you're looking at a product online, and someone comes online and says, like they do in those text boxes, do you need some help? And you go, yeah, I do. And they say, press this button, and we'll have a video call. And you press that button, and no downloads, no plugins, bang. You're in a video call with someone who can communicate with you, can have a chat, potentially sell you something. That is a radical change. If you're in business and you regularly make video conference calls, you're not going to want to use WebRTC. But if you're a consumer 
and you want to look about new wheelbarrows on Amazon, and Amazon has, a, has somebody at the other end who can talk to you about the relative merits of wheelbarrows, that is a very powerful tool. So they're different things, but extremely complementary. Any other points? I'm around for the next two days. I'll probably be crashing an Audi at some point. So um, that'll be an accession event, at least for me. And uh, I won't make the plus 20 years. I'm quite annoyed about that. So thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it, and I hope you got some. Thanks, Simon. All right, uh, we've got set up across the hall. We, uh, oh, a couple of things, too.